Hello all. It looks like it's the right time to start. We have um, we have some eager participants here, so probably we can make a start here. So I'd like to welcome everyone. A very hearty good morning to to everyone joining us today. I'm Janaki Nair, uh, an OCHS Research Fellow affiliated to Sharka Traditions Research Program and Director of this particular conference, Text and Ritual in Shakta Tantra. I'll be your host for this conference today, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. We sincerely hope that this conference will prove to be fruitful and informative for all the members participating in this conference. I'm grateful for all the speakers who have joined us today and to share their knowledge and experiences with us. As you might have read from our webpage, this conference aims to clarify and revalidate theoretical and practical aspects of Shakta Tantra. We will have two phases in this conference. One is Kerala phase, and the second one is Oxford phase. The first phase, that is today, which is the Kerala phase, will focus on embodied practice and the rich lived experience of performing Shakta rituals. We hope that this will map out a relatively new avenue of research where it will explore presentation of Shakta rituals in Keralan Tantric texts and how these are interpreted through practice within lineages and Tantric practitioners in Kerala. For the second phase, which is the Oxford phase, and it will be tomorrow, June 4th, we will have senior research scholars from University of Oxford presenting papers, and this phase will address the synergy, interplay, and overlap between ritual performances and texts in Shakta traditions. Thus, bringing together scholarly acumen and practitioners' first-hand knowledge, this conference hopes to make some meaningful interventions into the current discourse about text and ritual practice in Shakta Tantric traditions. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome our two distinguished keynote speakers, Professor Gavin Flett and Professor Chris Dorset. Professor Chris Dorset will deliver the keynote speech for the Kerala phase, which is today, and Professor Gavin Flett will deliver Oxford phase keynote speech tomorrow. Their willingness to share their knowledge and experiences makes this event possible. Professor Sorset is an artist and academic who, who has made significant contributions towards the field of arts. He's currently a research fellow at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, and he has been researching the museological legacy of the historian of Indian art, Philip Rawson. Our second day keynote speaker, Professor Gavin Flett is a professor of Hindu studies and comparative religion in the theology and religion faculty, University of Oxford, and our academic director of the Oxford Center for Hindu studies. These two authoritative speakers represent the best and brightest in their fields, and we are really honored to have them in this conference. I'm also taking this opportunity to thank my advisor, Dr. Bjarne Verneke Olesen and other sincere team members, Tanya Jacobson, Dr. Shana Stanwood, S. Radhakrishnan, Parameshwaran BK, and Vishnu Nambudri for their immense help and understanding all throughout. I'm sure this conference will truly exude the diverse spirit and will be an immense success. So before we start today's talks, a quick overview of today's schedule. For a rundown of what these two days hold, please refer to the program schedule. We will have four talks all together today. After mm -hmm. the keynote speech of Professor Chris Dorset, we will have three talks by eminent 
tantric practitioners in Malayalam language. We encourage you to download the English transcripts of these talks to make the most of the information and experience that they are going to share with us today. Where can you download this? We have sent an email to you all yesterday through Eventbrite with a link to download these documents and hope you all can access that. Alternatively, all the videos that we will be streaming today, the Malayalam videos that we are streaming today are also subtitled. So if in case there is any problem with downloading the English transcripts, you can still make sense of what these tantric practitioners are sharing with us today by reading the subtitles. And at the end of today's talk at 3.20 p.m., we will have a question time where I will take questions for our Malayalam speakers and the answers from them will be read out tomorrow in our discussion session at four o'clock. So if you if anyone have any questions for our Malayalam speakers or our tantric practitioners, we encourage them to type the questions in the chat box between our question time window, which is from 3.20 p.m. till four o'clock this evening. And if you have any questions for our keynote speaker from today, then you can direct those questions to him during our live discussion session tomorrow at four o'clock. Now, with that, we will have our keynote speech by Professor Chris Dorset next. And I would like to wish you all a great day ahead. Hello. I'm speaking here today because I supervised Dr. Janaki Nair's PhD on the semiotic status of mudra, the hand gestures she uses as a katakali performer. I'm an art specialist, a practitioner and teacher, and an early promoter of practice-based research in universities. Janaki's doctoral project was just this, practice-based. If the term is unfamiliar, I hope my paper will give the concept weight and scope as I proceed. And as this conference builds on her research, I'm offering a paper about practice as, a, as an investigatory tool. Given the context in which I'm speaking, it will quickly become clear that the most important things I know about the practices she investigates were learnt in Philip Rawson's 1971 Tantra exhibition at London's Haywood Gallery. In comparison to the, the first-hand accounts available elsewhere in this conference, or the huge accumulation of scholarship I have access to at the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies, this admission puts me at a disadvantage. And certainly, I'll have to justify my position as I go along. But for now, I want to make sure you understand that my first engagement with tantric ritual was through looking, not reading, looking at pictures and artefacts, that is. It involved my artistic sensibilities, not my language skills. So as a preliminary disclosure, I will quickly describe how I acquired the, a knowledge of tantra without textual study. At the Hayward, Rawson addressed the experimental aspirations of Western art students, which is exactly what I was at the time. According to a letter in the Art Council of Great Britain archive, he did this purposely. Those of us who thronged the exhibition were eager to better understand his passionate explorations of embodied and numinous values. Imagine walking through a labyrinth of unusually confined and sensually immersive displays. Listen to this. Rooms one and two were deep red and vermilion. Room three was a, a purple mulberry colour. Room four had black and smoke grey walls. In room five, they were pale green. Room six was bathed in burnt orange. Room seven was colourless, a matter of haptic sensibilities. In room eight, an indeterminate turquoise blue took over. And lastly, room nine was pure white. The Hayward is a spacious gallery, 
white walls, top-down light sources and carefully polished floors. So these small coloured rooms were, to say the least, a radical intervention. Rawson's exhibition was, was grasped bodily as a sequence of ambient interiors that embedded what you saw in emotional modalities that were far more subtle than Western art seemed to acknowledge. The catalogue called each room a rasa, and we went away wanting to know more about this term and its role in Indian aesthetics. So a vast corpus of academic literature awaited us outside the exhibition, but inside those coloured rooms, those coloured spaces, the procession of shifting emotions told you things too, and your interest kept pulling you forward, a, a temporal experience that was somehow incorporated into the meaning of the exhibition. The time it took to see the show was, for Rawson, an aesthetic medium in its own right. The viewing unfolded in passageways and lobbies. They weren't like a gallery. I say this because each space felt like the gateway to a further space. The time spent looking at, say, a cosmic diagram in a pale green room anticipated the time you would spend round the corner in an orange space viewing Richard Lenoy's photographs of tantric yogis. Each act of attention was bathed in a palpable sense of transition. You absorbed information, you read short texts, but you mainly surrendered yourself to an extraordinary range of sensations and feelings. None of us can actually divest our semiotic spectrum of its parts. We live in a world of immediate resemblances and interpretations. We trace things back to causes and willingly submit to conventional representations, that is, words. According to Charles Sanders Peirce, to whom we owe the most profound analysis of semiological processes, all types of signification overlap and merge. For example, lived experience embeds itself within academic study when researchers undertake ethnographic fieldwork. Here, theory and practice become a, a seamless spectrum of signs that, if the anthropological calling is realised, represent a larger totality. But we must also recognise that practice, qua practice, resists analysis. And so in order to underline the character of practice-based knowledge, I'm going to recall a moment I recognised a lived experience that an established anthropologist didn't. We were watching a video. A traditional object was being carved from a length of tree trunk at a location where these objects had traditionally been made. The details are not relevant. I just need to tell you that a rare example of these carvings had been destroyed, which was politically significant because the other examples had long since disappeared into European museums. So the anthropologist documented a new one being made. However, I could see that the person doing the carving hadn't carved before. I'm a very experienced woodcarver. And let's be clear about this, the experience I'm talking about is not confined to a particular tradition or indeed limited to art. My sculptural practices have led me to develop skills associated with cabinet making, as well as rough carpentry and green woodworking. And my art school background is relevant too. When, when teaching contemporary artists, one regularly encounters acts of renewal that deliberately sabotage past approaches and achievements. I'm used to assimilating purposefully bad art. And here I speak with care. So I must tell you that what I saw was unfamiliarity, not calculation. As I sat watching the video, knowing what I knew troubled me. After all, I had no contextual information that justified my evaluation. But if I had been told that these objects were always carved in this way, I wouldn't have believed it. Partly because historical evidence shows otherwise, 
but also because the carver's hands were not at ease with the tools he was using. As a maker, I sensed his discomfort with what he was doing. Even if this insight has no analytical purchase and is vulnerable to accusations of subjectivity, it does have critical leverage. Artists should question what they see, and I saw that he didn't know what he was doing. Even though he must have known how the original looked and understood its significance in a way that I didn't. However, my position is vulnerable. Values are different in different cultures and I cannot guarantee that my evaluations would hold in every case, wherever and whenever they are applied. This would be dangerously close to some form of essentialism, a no-no for anthropologists. But hold on, culturally specific explanations are not sufficient either. As I said, creative practitioners consciously subvert accepted ways of doing things. And so not knowing boils down to not basing unacceptability in practice-based knowledge, which is why despite anthropology's explanatory force, I cannot deny what is learnt firsthand by hand. Oh dear, if this is how practice-based knowledge works, it is a very disruptive way of knowing things. I feel wary, disconcerted. What in the end was my evaluation for? It's not my place to say that the artifact I saw being produced was not a contribution to a cultural knowledge base. It almost certainly was. In this sense, what was carved was a remediation, Bolter and Grusin's term for updating older technical processes with current ones. I accept that. But I also accept that complications like these are multi-layered. The relationship between a practice and its medium is layered and complicated. And I want to add my own layers of Rawson scholarship to this story. Bear with me. I'll begin with his use of the word glyph. It originally referred to another type of carving, an inscription. For example, a hieroglyph brings to mind ancient symbols cut into stone surfaces. Rawson reformulated this idea, changing its field of reference to any emphatic mark making in a drawing process. This kind of glyph introduces the structural and conceptual apparatus, Rawson thought, belonged specifically to graphic artworks. This is a good place to start building a description of practice-based knowledge because Rawson's drawing ideas were concurrent with his Tantra project, which strongly suggests in the context of this conference, we should pay attention to a deeply felt interest in the graphic arts that simultaneously embraced tantric philosophy. One can sense the two working together when he says that expressive glyphs carry symbolic suggestions by reason of their shape. They will seem to gesture at you emphatically, almost as though they were alive. Such statements are a good example of Rawson's pedagogic aspirations. He was trying to teach you something. He wanted you to engage sensitively with a transformative process. And indeed, the 1969 book I'm quoting from was listed as art appreciation. But it reads like an instruction manual. It suggests that there are systems you could learn and new formulae to study and adapt if you already drew. However, the instructions are mind boggling. A body of esoteric knowledge is placed tantalizingly before you, but a codified vocabulary stops access. For example, it seems strange to call an outline a contour, and the shapes that contours construct seem oddly technical when called enclosures. The jargon is alienating, but also teachable. The book shows how the profundity of drawing can be articulated and communicated. I know from personal memory that Rawson's ambitions were educational. 
He was clear that familiarity with the conceptual basis of drawing was the key to passing on insights from generation to generation. But surely it's a contradiction. His language makes it harder to draw. Let's watch a clip from Michael Dibbs 1976 film Seen Through Drawing. It documents artists and artists who are also art teachers deliberating on drawing's purpose. At the time, arguments were raging about how the skills should be taught. Conceptual art, the height of fashion, didn't need drawing. Art education did. Rawson, whose book had prompted the film, sits at a Steenbeck editing table, providing a post-production commentary. Now this drawing by Van Gogh shows marvellously what drawing can do and no other medium can. It's full of lines, chalk lines, which express movement and life. And that movement and life isn't only in the figure of the sower who's sowing the seed. It's actually in the field upon which he's working. Uh, you feel that the whole thing is imbued with the, with the life of the soil, which he was very much aware of. And of course, there's even uh, an attempt in the clouds to draw the weather and to draw the weather not as a sort of stationary phenomenon, but of the weather actually doing it. And uh, it is this feeling of uh, the man sowing, of the field fielding, and the cottage cottaging uh, as, as verbs, doings, that uh, Van Gogh was always capable of capturing. And many of his late drawings like this one are absolutely full of this extraordinary sense of life he felt in nature. And his letters are full of discussions of the difficulty he experienced in trying to find graphic equivalents before those feelings that he experienced in front of landscape, in front of the people who lived and worked in the drawing by Titian, the first thing you see is the movement rather than the figures. You see the interaction, what's going on. And in many other drawings, especially drawings of the Renaissance, again, you actually perceive what is going on before you perceive the detail represented in the figures. And it's this movement, action and drama in progress that is the real subject of the drawing. You follow a line of meaning between bodies and you can pick up a kind of human drama which is actually going on and it casts your imagination backwards in time and forwards in time. You imagine what went before and what is coming after. These ideas sound teachable, don't they? As Rawson says, the real subject of a drawing is the realm of time in which the construction in progress completes itself. This is a unique characteristic, only drawings do it. Each little piece of time, each moment of graphic doing is evidence of its own construction. I want to focus on two temporal categories that Rawson often used, the time it takes to do a drawing and the time required to see its sequential structure. What then does it take, temporally speaking, to see this Indian sacred diagram? During the 1960s, lots of these beautiful drawings turned up in London. Notice the creases. They were folded when purchased in order to be carried around as charms. Consequently, many arrived from India in travellers' pockets. Consider then the time taken to view your prized yantra, the special one you kept as a souvenir. Think about how its two-dimensional surface opened up as it unfolded and how this opening animated the diagram. Something notionally flat was given actual movement in real time. Rawson saw drawings in exactly these terms, every kind of drawing. The glyphs that cover a page cover it in time. The time taken to construct the image enfolds its meaning. And the time it's now taking us to view this slide is not outside his formula. Looking at those creases and the delicate linear structure we are, whether we like it or not, reverse engineering. In a Spalding Symposium paper, Rawson praised Indian artworks for showing non-Indians how to restore, that is, unfold their experience of Genesis. These diagrams point us back to the moment before 
space and time were created. They address a, a shared human concept for a point of origin. Therefore, a good drawing doesn't conceal its first tentative marks. And calculating where I'd started to draw was the unnerving teaching skill Rawson applied to my work when I was a student at the Royal College of Art. Back then, his perceptivity seemed like a conjuring trick and nobody else could do it. Remember, this paper falls back on direct experience. As well as joining the crowds of art students who flocked to Tantra, I was taught by Rawson and the content I'm using is not really in his books. It is the product of a lifetime of conversations. Yes, he, he taught me to draw, but later I often taught drawing with him. And so our debates continued across a good part of my career. I would say in Rawson's hands, drawing became something like a ritualistic practice and consequently his ritualization of my drawing skills has operated as a model of practice-based research. He taught me how to embed systematic approaches within embodied techniques. Let me demonstrate what I mean. Look at this gramophone record. It dates from 1946. The material is acetate. I know that a message was recorded on its surface. These grooves still store those sounds. Sounds that in the 1940s made gramophone needles vibrate. The message was a verbal one, but even when nothing was said, the needle vibrated. Ambient noise influenced the transmission by shaping the way the record was heard. I inherited it when my father died 20 years ago. It was one of his post-war projects. Following demobilization, he and his brothers set up an audio letter business. They built their own recording equipment and, and throughout my childhood, test samples were stored in the loft of our family home. On rainy days, I would play them on a wind-up gramophone and hear my father speaking before I was born. Sadly, they're unplayable now. The acetate is turning to powder in places you can brush it away with your finger. Even so, my father's voice is still there, although no gramophone needle will release the sounds inscribed on the acetate again. Thus, this object endures. It's vividly present, but without a function, unless it becomes a drawing. Look then at this drawing. It's iterative, not linear. Iteration is a, is a ritualistic practice suggesting activities or actions that encircle or loop around. I have drawn my father's records repetitively, but I've also routinely consulted Rawson's Tantra catalogue. It looks as though I've drawn a chakra, doesn't it? The glyphs loop expressively and keep looping they gesture as they loop over each other. Eventually, these gestures are so dense that time taken to create them disappears. So, unlike the reverse engineering we've discussed, you can't trace your way back to a point of origin. The glyphic narrative has gone. Mute objecthood has taken over. The results are not just a refusal to reverse engineer the circular glyphs suck in words. They construct a black hole as dark and silent as the grooves on my father's record. Nevertheless, there are glyphs before you, hiding in plain sight. The time it took me to draw them is visible, but it sits beyond verbal articulation. I'm hoping you'll find this tantric. And I hope you see applications for my practice-based mode of research. As with the study of tantric texts, especially their esoteric dimension, the language I'm borrowing protects my tantric tendencies with technical esotericism, Paul Valery's wonderful term. The further Rawson's terminology takes you into the mysteries of drawing, the more you realise that the techniques he's talking about are fundamentally hostile to words. Consequently, his vocabulary conceals rather than instructs. 
It's jargon. His jargon is difficult. His jargon needs initiation. And it's only because I've repetitively refined this practice that the code finally broke. The drawing book is really a carefully written introduction to an esoteric zone. To conclude, I will offer short examples of the sorts of things Rawson used to say. This marvellous drawing from 18th century Rajasthan is in many ways the equal of verbal language. Just look at what the artist did. Think hand, wrist, elbow, then see her beautiful arm. It confounds anatomical definition. Her world is not named parts. The enclosures elide dictionary style concepts. It's deceptively simple. It's very poetic, visually so. For Rawson, drawings offer us ontologies beyond the scope of words. And there's more. Rawson says that the space through which this girl walks is perfumed. The sinuous contours and the rounded enclosures are marks on paper, they're visual, but other senses intrude. The very surface of the drawing effectively triggers aromatic memories. Remember, Glyph's gesture, they intrude. Rawson could have said, subvert. Glyph's intrusively convey sound, touch, kinesis. This is very subversive. Which brings me back to the Tantra exhibition. What comes to mind is walking through that labyrinth of confined spaces. They were very crowded, lots of my contemporaries moving about, lingering, giving attention, then moving again. It was 1971 and the people I'm talking about were nearly all art students. The arrangement of nine consecutive rooms confounded our modernist conviction that an exhibit worth seeing required minimal contextualization. Nothing should distract you. It was an art world thing. The dominant mode of display was, and still is, the white cube gallery, white walls, top-down light, and carefully maintained floors, features that suited modern art. And it was in this kind of featureless gallery that Rawson gathered together hundreds of historical Indian items, sculptures, paintings, and sacred objects. It was here he installed small purpose-built spaces and heightened the viewer's sensory engagement room by room with vivid colours, ambient sound, and slide projections. Tantra was widely held to have had greater contemporary resonance than the 11 Los Angeles artists exhibiting in the Haywards upper galleries. Rawson's exhibits were anything but modern. After this, contemporary art would no longer be modern art. It was a revelation that has stayed with me. Indeed, the striking red catalogue I purchased at the Hayward all those years ago has remained in my studio. Metaphorically speaking, it now has many loose pages. They represent a great deal of diversification and accumulated know-how. As an artist curator best known for intervening in museum collections, I know that the time needed to look at exhibits has its own value, whatever the interpretive panel says. But conversely, as a museum-based academic, I write about Rawson and Tantra in a post-structuralist, post-modern and post-colonial world, which, guided by abstract atemporalities, re-theorises Hayward-like spaces right for Rawson-style interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was an excellent talk and, and a quite a thought provoking one. I'm sure all participants would agree with me in that. Um, there is quite a lot to contemplate on what you shared with us today. And, and I hope that we will 
get to the bottom of your ideas um, soon. Um, thank you again. We will next have a short coffee break um, and that will be for 15 minutes. So we will come back by 11.55 um, to start listening to the tantric practitioners. So 11.55, we will resume our, uh, our conference back. See you in a bit. Thank you.